Okay, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll read God's word together. I'll remind you of the big idea this morning is that the chief shepherd or the good shepherd entrusts the care of his sheep to qualified elders. So we've been slowing down in this passage over the next couple of weeks, at, at least three, to look at the importance of leadership in the church of God. And let's read the text together, and then I'll begin. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful you've given us your word. Uh, we're not groping in the dark. We are not lost. We are not trying to come up with our understanding of who you are from reason or from uh, scientific observation. We are coming to your word as clear and coherent and understandable and thankful that we can spend time in worship to you and that through that worship you, from hearing you, you actually even change us in the midst. So we ask you to give us great understanding and a willingness to follow after you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the confusion surrounding what a pastor is can be uh, clearly perceived in what titles are used for pastors today, maybe even descriptions of what they do. Let me just share a few of them. Pastors can be coaches, visionaries, catalytic agents of change. They're thought leaders, strategists, movement makers, marketers, innovators, and chief creative architects. The strange thing you'll find now in, in today's sort of evangelical, popular culture is to find a pastor who's a pastor. Uh, that, that whole ancient concept, the imagery of the shepherd is so old school, maybe we need something new, something fresh, something more relevant to our current culture. So it's not only found in the titles and responsibilities of what the pastor does, where there's confusion, but in also who the pastor is or should be. I don't know if you all are aware of this or not, but there are reality TV shows that get into the lives of pastors. So it's, a, it's based on the life of a pastor. And the purpose for that reality TV show, according to the pastor, is that, you know, some people think that, that pastors aren't human. And so they need to see, like, the real lives of the pastor. And they, they need to see in their homes. And what do they get a picture of? Uh, materialistic, hypocritical, bad pastors. So with the intention of saying, let's just, let's just communicate what, what a real pastor is, kind of that down-to-earth person, does the culture really need that type of understanding of a pastor? What is the cultural perception of a pastor? You could uh, look at literature, media, movies, entertainment. What is the pastor, right? He's the hypocrite. He's the self-promoting, the troubled person, sneaky, the money-hungry bum. Isn't that what we find in the media? So what does a pastor actually need to be? Is he, he need to be down to earth like everybody else? No, the Bible says he's supposed to be godly. Yes, a pastor needs grace, is imperfect, and yet the biblical picture of a pastor is someone who you can say, that is a godly person. So we get this idea from the Bible that the pastor is not the catalytic innovator. He is rather the shepherd who, guess what, reflects the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. He's a godly man who loves his family, loves the church, and is willing to even lay down his life 
for them. So we need to understand what this picture is. We've got misconceptions out there. What does the Bible teach about a pastor or an elder or an overseer? We want to know. And this is important, as I said last week. It's key for us taking part in the Great Commission, sending out pastors and missionaries from us, revitalizing churches in the area. Who should we send? It's key to our church's present and future health, not only in the current pastoring taking place here, but who's going to pastor the church when I'm gone, when the other pastors are gone? What about the next generation? And it's key. This type of study is key to our own pastor's encouragement and ongoing faithfulness. You pastors, brothers, you need to hear and be encouraged and directed and fine-tuned in your work as pastors, myself including, included. So last week we looked at some inter- introductory assumptions. We didn't really get into the text, and so in that sense it was, a, it was a little bit of a different way of preaching. I was more saying, hey, these are some things that are assumed here by Peter. He just says, hey, I exhort the elders among you. Who are elders? What is that whole concept? So we look at the origins of elders, and this will be somewhat of a uh, just a reminder, a refresher of what we covered last week. Conceptually, it's present in the Old Testament, people of God, elders. It's found in the synagogue during the intertestamental period of these leaders in the people of God. And yet, we don't take our cues precisely from their role. We get the cues as to what they do from the New Testament revelation. But that's where it originated from. And then as the apostles were starting to die off, they ensure that there is strong spiritual leadership within these churches in the form of elders. I also mentioned, well, I guess I didn't mention, but I should mention here that those elders function in a plurality, that there are always described in the New Testament churches multiple pastors, elders, slash overseers. That, That terminology is used interchangeably. And then you also don't find one pastor above the other pastors. There is what is called parity, shared authority. And so that was the elder origins, and then we went to the elder qualifications. Who is this pastor? Where did he come from? How do we know he should be a pastor? And we looked at first, the person had to have a desire. He's not to be serving under compulsion. He's also to be a male that is not disparaging to the role of a woman, but it's God's design. And then he's supposed to possess certain traits that I described by the five C's. Character, conviction, care for the church, competency, which those things viewed over time actually lend to credibility, which is the biblical picture of a pastor. Someone whose life lines up with what they teach, preach, and how they lead. And those men, as long as they are desiring that office, church sees fit, that they should be in that office, should become elders. And then I also looked at an assumption based on 1 Peter 5 also of church membership, formal church membership. Now, when I say that, some people are like, what? Church membership? Where's that in the Bible that I need to have an interview with the pastor? I need to fill out membership paperwork. I need to go to a few classes before I can join the church. That's not what I was talking about there. There are a few words here that seem to imply that there is a group of pastors over a particular group of people whom they are called and tasked with shepherding, and those people are called and tasked to submit to their leadership. Not all pastors in the area of Omaha or in the world, but a specific group of pastors. And so there's this obviously mutually considered and identifiable relationship between the two, which could be described as church membership. All right, that kind of catches us up to where we are, and I had to shut it down. I had one more point. I was going to talk about church government. If the elders possess authority, do they rule and in terms of make all the decisions in the church? And I wanted to touch on that briefly because there are certain people who say yes and there are certain people who say no. And there are a few different types of church government out there that you'll find in the different church models. And I'm not going to go through all the different church government models, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, elder rule, but I do want to try and address this issue. 
And this, the, the difficulty of landing on a specific church government is not because the Bible's not clear or because uh, it just can't be known or we can do whatever we want, but it's mainly just because of how the Bible presents it. Remember, in the book of Acts, this is a church that is organically forming. And so things are happening. Things that happened in the first century aren't happening even today with certain gifts, apostles, prophets, all these things. So we have to take into consideration that things are developing. And if you're uncomfortable with that, there's nothing to do about it. That's the Bible. It's organically revealed by God and develops over time. So basically, if, if I wanted to talk about the difficulty of church government, I could look just at the fact of who appoints a pastor in the church. Um, you know, we talked about the qualifications of a pastor, but who ultimately decides who should be a pastor? Is it other elders? Is it, as it looked like in the first century, apostles appointing pastors? Is it some kind of intuition that we just have? Is it an audible declaration by God that we should do this? Should we cast lots? You see that in Acts chapter 1 of choosing an apostle. What are we supposed to do? And you would say, well, I remember in Acts, it says that Paul appointed the, uh, the elders in the church. Paul and Barnabas were involved in that. Well, you can look at the, the word itself and, and see like what's happening there. You look at Titus. Titus, who's a delegate of the apostle Paul, is called to appoint elders. But then if you look at Acts chapter 6, in the sort of establishing of certain leaders in the church, what do the apostles say? Choose from among yourselves. And then we have the challenge of like Acts 14, Acts 15, where the congregation elders and apostles choose who would go with Barnabas. And so all I'm saying is we're trying to weigh out all the evidence here to come up with a system of how the authority within the congregation actually works. I hope I haven't confused you because I'm going to try and bring it all together here under this header of church government. If there are more identifiable people in a church with authority or groups, you might say, elders have authority, congregation has authority, how do these work together? So let's think of this together. If the Bible uses terms like rule, for elders, you must submit to the elders or obey the elders, then it's obvious, right? Elders make the decisions. Not necessarily so. We as a church used to think that was the case. In 2017, we changed our, con our constitution to reflect what we saw as more of a biblical model in that two bodies possess authority, elders and the congregation. Let's look at this first. Let's, let's talk about the elder's authority. Because when we're talking about church government, that's what we're saying. Who has authority in the church? Who runs the church? Who makes decisions? And so let's talk about the elder's authority first. First, that it is derived. Who is the chief shepherd? If you look at verse 4 of 1 Peter 5, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. If we look up chapter 2, verse 25, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Pastors do not possess authority in and of themselves as if it can be passed down from bloodline or a certain class of people. It is, a, it is a, an appointing that Christ does through the Holy Spirit and then through the church itself. And so it's a derived authority. And because it's derived, it's not inherent to myself or the other pastors. We are then held responsible or held accountable to the one who gave it. Then we also see that the elder's authority is designed. It's specifically designed for one thing. It is to bless. It is to do good. That is the purpose of authority in the Bible. It is to be used and, and stewarded well. We also see that their authority is divided. I talked about there's a plurality of pastors among the eldership. So it's not one person unilaterally making decisions. I want to also make mention that that authority is actual. It is a real authority. 
Because if I'm starting to talk about congregational authority, you're saying, well, then what is the elder authority you're speaking of? It's actual. The church is to recognize, submit, and obey their leaders. Why? Because God has appointed them. He's established this. The Bible even says that Jesus will condemn unlawful acts of disobedience to elder authority on the last day. And we might also say that a pattern of unrepentant insubordination to the pastor's rule can be grounds for church discipline. And you might be saying, wow, this is real. I need to, I need to listen. And I'm called to submit to these elders. What does that actually mean, though? What I've said so far would lead someone to say, okay, man, the elders make all the decisions and rule, and they have a certain authority to do that. But it's still more complicated than that. Because as much as I've talked about the elders' authority so far, it's also limited. It's limited in its scope and in its power, okay? In its scope. The elders' authority does not extend beyond Scripture. That is, I don't have the authority to go around into your life prying around what house are you going to buy, what college are you going to do, what job are you going to work, who are you going to marry, these kind of things. I can't go ahead and do that because my authority is as a teacher of God's word. And so if God's word addresses particular issues in your life, and I'm able to speak from the Bible into that, then that would be authority that's safely given to a pastor. But that can be definitely abuse, so I'm limiting the authority to that scripture. But then also, it's limited in its power. And by that, mean I mean that it is not the final say in the congregation. The authority of pastors has helpfully been described in this way. It is the authority of counsel. That is why pastors are called and tasked to be able to teach God's word. Our ministry is that of teaching, explaining the word of God to you for what purpose? So that you will be able to, as a congregation, actually utilize properly the authority that God has given to you. And you're saying, what authority is that? Well, let me explain. Let me talk about how these go together. The pastor's authority is real, it's actual, it's derived, but it's limited. The congregation's authority, on the other hand, is final. You might call it the command. So the pastors have the authority of counsel. They teach, they make recommendations for decisions. The authority has the final, uh, the congregation's authority is the final say. And why do I say that? Well, they're the final authority in disputes. I could talk about four ways. Disputes, doctrines, discipline, and membership. In disputes, you remember Matthew 18. Some people sin against one another. One goes to him, the person doesn't repent. Two or three go to that person, they don't repent. What does he say to do? What does Jesus tell the church to do in that sense? Does he say, tell it to a past, tell it to a bishop? Tell it to the presbyters or a group of elders? Tell it to a pastor? No, he says tell it to the church. And then the church then makes that declaration of treating someone as a Gentile and a tax collector. That's called church discipline. But in the matter of dispute, the church figures that out. Then when we think of doctrine, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul chastises the Galatian church. Why? Because they're listening to false teaching. He says, if anybody comes and preaches you a different gospel than one I've given you, let him be accursed. What are you doing listening to him? Who does he chastise? Is he chastising the leaders? No, he's just chastising the church because the church is the ones who determine whom they are to be listening to. Who would be the pastors? That's reiterated in 2 Timothy 4, 3 when he counsels Timothy on what might, they might expect about the church appointing or putting forward teachers who would tickle their own ears. That's a negative example there. Based on passages like Acts 6, of which I mentioned, Acts 15, the church being a, a, involved in the appointing of pastors, we would say that the final court of authority as to 
who would be a pastor in the church, who would set the doctrine and all this, is the church. And then we also talk about discipline. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul appeals to the whole Corinthian congregation when he says, you've got someone in your midst who has an incestuous relationship with their mother-in-law. I can't believe this is happening. What are they supposed to do? He says, you're supposed to put that person out from among you. The goal, of course, in that is restoration. They want to to do that so the person would see the, the seriousness of their offense against God. But he chastises the church for that. And then you might also say in matters of membership. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, that person could be talking about the same person who was put out of the church is described in this terms, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. He's talking to the whole congregation. Somebody had been put out of their midst by the majority. That means somehow the church made a consensus that this is what they should do. We take that as voting in modern day. But then also that the church is supposed to welcome him back in. That means, where are the pastors at in this whole thing? The church is making those decisions. So, when we're talking about the authority of the congregation, we're talking about it being final in matters of disputes, doctrine, or teaching, teachers, discipline, and membership. So where are the elders at in that whole thing, though? They have authority, too. He's just conflicting with one another. Well, the congregation's authority is also not only final, but it's a counseled authority. A counseled. That means those pastors who are among them, those elders who are chosen as godly men, who know sound teaching, the the church should be wondering, hey, what do you all think we should do in this situation? And so the pastors lead in these areas and say, this is what we're finding, but the ultimate say, the final, is a vote from the congregation, somehow coming to a consensus as to what that should be. So, the congregation's authority is final, it's counseled, and I must also say that it is fallible. It's fallible. By that I mean that throughout church history, churches, groups of people, are sinful and make the wrong decisions. Even based on pastors giving them the wrong counsel. So, it's not ultimate in this sense. So, good pastors have been fired from their jobs. Think of Jonathan Edwards for that instance. You have people put out of a church that probably should not have been put out of a church. Does that mean those people are excommunicated there's no hope? No, because what should a church also have? Churches should be in other networks with other churches, friendly cooperation, to where that person who was put out of this church should be able to go to another church and seek counsel and hopefully pursue reconciliation with the church and get things figured out. That's in our Constitution as well as the London Baptist Confession. So the congregation's authority is final, it's counseled, it's fallible. And then let me just give you one more final thought on abuse of authority. Authority on both sides can be abused. Cannot the the pastors uh, manipulate, coerce, mishandle their authority? Yes, they can become legalistic, manipulative, harsh, They can gossip, they can take away responsibilities, and they can teach false doctrine. On the other hand, congregations can fire their more conservative pastors for a more liberal person who's more relevant, who's more in tune with the culture's direction. So we must say that those things can definitely happen and have happened. So we're not saying that this model can't be messed up. It can. But what we try and practice at Emmaus is called elder-led congregationalism. And although that term has been new, uh, new to many people, 
back in 2017 especially, the concept itself is not new. As soon as you had the Reformation in the 1500s and people started studying their Bibles and and really trying to discern if church tradition was correct, especially in, in how the church is governed, there was a reforming process that took place to where people came to this understanding that the pastors have authority in the church and the congregation has ultimate authority in these. How do they work together? The pastors lead, teach, counsel, direct, but the, ultimately the congregation makes final decisions on these matters. Not on everything. It's up to a church to figure out, you know, who, who's going to make decisions, everyday staff stuff and, you know, the color of the carpet and all that. I'm not trying to say let's, let's have a meeting and decide on everything. Pastors should be able to lead in some of those. But on these big Big matters, the uh, disputes, doctrine, discipline, and membership, it is the congregation who has the final say. All right, for you all, you're saying, okay, that's good to know as pastors. What does that mean for you? What is your job description as a member of a church that has authority? What does this push you to do? It pushes you to know your Bibles. It pushes you to know what a pastor is, and what a pastor should be. It puts a ton of responsibility on you as the final say. Yes, you're just one vote out of many, but you're responsible for these matters. What does a a professing believer with a, a lifestyle connected together look like? Who should be welcomed into membership? whose lifestyle is not lining up that should be put out of membership. Now, you don't have to figure all these things out all the time. Like, I need to know every single member in exactly in their life. That's the pastor's job. But we work together as a congregation in these matters. So, know what's expected of members? What's in our church covenant? What's in our church covenant? Confession, um, attend regularly services and members' meetings where we actually ex- ex- exercise the authority of the keys, and then submit to your leaders joyfully, cheerfully. Hold us accountable as well. All right, with all that said, then about introductory assumptions. Okay, this is all just kind of packed into that word elders right there. That's it. That's how far we got in the text. I exhort the elders among you. That's, that's it. Uh, we're actually ready now to get into this passage, and we'll see how far we get. I've got my eye on the clock here. Um, so let's read the passage again into verse 3. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. We'll stop there. So with the introductory assumptions under our belt, now let's turn to important questions for understanding Peter's exhortation to the elders. I hope you see that right there. He's exhorting. He's appealing to the elders. As good Bible students, we're always asking, how does this passage fit in with the overall context of not only the chapter, the section, but all the whole book as well? And what word do we see right at the beginning? So, I exhort the elders among you. So, well, what has just gone on before? Remember, judgment has begun at the household of God, speaking of this fiery trial that's upon them, to test them, to refine them. And what is it? That form of persecution. In light of this, look at verse 19 of chapter 4. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So, I exhort the elders among you. Why does he go right to elders? Well, you could be thinking... Maybe it's just a whole new section. It's not connected at all. But this word so is used to connect it. Why? There's not huge scholarly consensus as to exactly why that is. But you could think of a 
few things. One, if the idea before was persecution of the church, and that is taking place first at the household of God, you could look biblically from the Old Testament, and you would find actually that Ezekiel, in chapter 9, speaks of judgment beginning at the household of God, the temple mainly, and then it says, in particular with the elders. So there could be a biblical conception there. It could also be just practically who are, who's going to receive the brunt of persecution, especially if that extends into the government. Being against Christianity, the pastors are going to be the first one to get it. You could also say just practically what happens when there's suffering and difficulty and persecution within the church. There's more temptations for schism. There's people doubting. There's all sorts of things that could be taking place that the pastors are called now to shepherd the flock. People might be wandering. People need encouragement. People are suffering. They need care. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So those are the connections here. It's all setting us up for the task of pastors. Pastors are courageous men who, through thick and thin, are going to fulfill their task faithfully. All right, so let's talk about another introductory question. Why did Peter give instructions about elders to the whole church? Remember, this is a letter to a church. He's addressed different groups in the church, but why now pastors? Why doesn't he send a separate letter to pastors addressing them? Well, because he wants the entire church to know the roles, responsibilities, duties of a pastor. So that, why? They can hold them responsible. They know how to pray that for them. Everybody knows what a challenge it is in any relationship if expectations are either unknown or unrealistic. And so Peter's trying to help the whole congregation function appropriately. He hits it all. Here's the responsibilities of the pastor. Here's the disposition of the pastor that you should be looking for in him. Here's what he's to be doing. Here's how you actually should be responding to him. And then he also addresses the fact how difficult this task will be so that you might actually be praying for them, supporting them, loving your pastors. Another introductory question would be, why does Peter give his credentials here? He's essentially giving his resume here. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God. Why does he do that? In fact, why does he talk about this fellow elder language? Why doesn't he say, I'm an apostle. Y'all need to listen to me. It's, it's a beautiful picture of what he's doing here. So let me just talk about that. First, why does he call himself a fellow elder? One is to show the continuity of authority that passes from the apostles in their leadership of the church to the elders. So as the apostles are going to die off, there's not modern day apostles, I just wanna let you know that. We could go into more argumentation of why that is. Peter says, hey y'all, I'm a fellow elder also. So you don't have to be looking for more apostles, I'm also a fellow elder. I'm doing the work that you're doing. What do we think of when we talk about the work of an elder and that Peter was called to do that? Remember John chapter 21. Remember, he has that interaction with Christ after Peter has blown it, but he's going to be restored. And what does Jesus do? He asks him those questions. Peter, do you love me? And he says, of course I do. And what does Jesus say? Feed my lambs. He says, tend my sheep. He says, shepherd my sheep. And so Peter then grabs a hold of that as an apostle with a unique ability to uh, do miracles, to establish the, the credibility of the apostolic message, and to write scripture, also says, hey, my task has been no different than you, yours. I'm called to shepherd the sheep. And so as a fellow elder, I'm right in the thick with you all. He's also then an example of humility. Far be it that here Peter is the first pope 
who's above and beyond all other elders or bishops or archbishops or anything like this below him. That's not right to think of it that way. It is rather, I'm a fellow elder. I'm right there with you all. We have the same task, same qualifications. We're doing this. And then he goes on and he talks about, he appeals to them based on his position as a witness of Christ's sufferings. It'd be very easy for me to just say, well, this is about the fact that he saw Christ die and he even saw him raised. I wish it were that easy, but the way this is worded, it leads us towards two other explanations. A witness of the sufferings of Christ. First off, it doesn't seem like from Scripture that Peter was at the crucifixion of Christ, so that would mean he's talking about maybe seeing him at the trial. So he saw the sufferings of Christ. He did see him at the resurrection, so that is an option. But this term witness also talks about what his role is as an apostle. Remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, you are to be my witnesses. They are to be those who proclaim what? His life, death, and resurrection. That doesn't mean we're not witnesses either. We are witnesses. Not in the eyewitness sense, but we are to witness. We proclaim what Christ has done based upon the testimony of Scripture. But there's a third way to think of this also. He's a witness of the sufferings of Christ. If you look back at chapter 4, look with me at verse 13. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. It sounds so similar. A witness of Christ's sufferings, if you look at our text now in chapter 5, where he says, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a sharer in the glory that is going to be revealed. Those two concepts could come together very easily. I'm a witness. I've seen the sufferings of Christ. I've even shared in it. And we know that Peter was one who had been persecuted and even towards the end of his life would be martyred. What happens in the book of Acts? He's beaten after they're taken, after he heals the man. They leave rejoicing, even though they're not supposed to preach the word of God. They continue on. In James, uh, Acts chapter 12, his friend James is beheaded, killed. Peter's in prison. He's thinking his death is coming shortly. I mean, he's suffered crazy amounts. So those two is which way I would lean of whether I think he's more of a witness of the, in the sense of a proclaimer, which then ties into this here. He says to the elder, as a fellow elder, you could also say, and a fellow witness. The way syntactically you could look at that, a fellow elder and a fellow witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker, meaning that the elders also are in the same camp. So there's continuity of their roles. And then we also say there's just uh, a, a great coming down, stooping to these pastors to encourage them in persecution just, hey, I'm right there with you all. Continue in your work. Now, we're going to then get into the intrinsic responsibility of elders. We looked at introductory assumptions, some interpretive questions, and now intrinsic responsibilities. I'm only going to be able to introduce this, and we'll pick it up next week. The intrinsic responsibility of the elders, I want to address the domain, the duties, and the disposition of a pastor. Let's first talk about the domain. The domain, look at this. It says, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. I think it's very important for pastors and for you all to recognize that this is God's flock, it's not ours. We are stewards or guardians. That means we're not at liberty to innovate, make up, or do whatever we want to do with God's 
flock. Everyone knows a good babysitter when you've had one. A good babysitter, obviously all analogies break down, but a good babysitter is one whom you tell them what they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, hey, this is what's for dinner. This is what time the kids go to bed. This is what they're going to be doing. And you expect that to get accomplished. A bad babysitter, you come home, what, the kids are still up? The kitchen's a mess. There is, you know, you ask them what they did, and they're like, oh, I watched a movie. We watched a movie together. And you're like, where'd you get the movie? Oh, I brought it. What's the rating? It's R. This kind of stuff, that's, that's bad babysitting. Bad pastoring is saying you can take something that's God's and who he's dealt out the directions to how it's to be cared for and managed, and yet you come up with your own agenda, your own ideas? No, no, no. This is his flock, and it's not ours. With this domain talk also, this term of God's flock, we also have to realize as pastors that the flock of God is very precious to him. This book in 1 Peter has talked about the church as a treasured possession. Jesus talks about how he loves the sheep as the good shepherd. He's willing to even lay down his life for the sheep. He calls the sheep his friends. He protects the sheep. So that should heighten up like entry into the pastorate, but then also the ongoing work of the pastor. What are you dealing with here? This is the church that's precious in the sight of God. And because of that, there's quite a few warnings. James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Why is that? Because the church is precious to God. And that's why the judgment that awaits false teachers is horrendous. It's not described, it's, it's described worse than anything you could imagine. And I'm not like scared that you all are going to become false teachers. What I want you to derive from that is how much God loves his flock. Wolves coming in, ravaging the sheep, he despises it. And they will pay. Let me just give you a few terms on that. He talks about in Galatians, they will be accursed. He talks about in Galatians 5, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, the views of the false teachers, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty whoever he is. We must be on guard for our teaching as pastors if we do not want to fall into this camp, but also we must be on guard for our lifestyle. The shepherds are to lead by example. That means our poor example can lead people astray and cause them to stumble. And once again, the Bible speaks very clearly to that. Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. I'm trying to derive from this the reality that this is God's flock. He loves the flock, and it needs to be taken care of, respected, cherished. Now, addressing pastors, obviously the application is clear, but what about you as a congregation? How do you treat God's flock? Yes, you are one of them, but yes, you are also responsible to one another. Don't play around with the cheap. Do not be divisive. Do not gossip. Do not mistreat. Do not slander. Do not be a hypocrite dragging the name of Christ and his reputation through the mud, but do love, serve, give towards, pray for, 
enjoy the bride of Christ, the flock of God. This is God's flock. The pastors are to shepherd God's flock. But it's not just God's flock, it's God's flock among you. That means I'm not responsible to every Christian in the world or in Omaha or in other churches. I'm responsible to the flock among you. And so, if you look at verse 3, you could also see that it says, um, not domineering over those in your charge. This is the same idea. They're among you, but they've been entrusted to you by God. If that's the case, then pastors have certain responsibilities. They are to shepherd the flock among them. That means they are to know who is God's flock among us. It means and implies that we should know who's truly a Christian here or not. Not that we're peering into everybody's hearts, but we're asking questions. Hey, are you a believer? That's why we do membership interviews. Just tell us the gospel. How is someone right before God? What's your relationship with sin? Have you repented? Do you, do you understand that we're not to just live however we want? We're to know God's, who God's flock is among us. But then, we also should know the sheep individually. Jesus is the model for this, is he not? When he says, I know my sheep by name. They hear my voice, they follow. There is an intimacy describing here this relationship. Shepherd the flock among you, you know them, which might lead you away from the 7,000 member congregation with six services and eight campuses. There's some value in the pastors actually knowing who the sheep are so they can shepherd them. But then they should also know the church corporately. What are the strengths, weaknesses, what are the issues, what, what's taking place in the church? And this is the great burden of the pastor because we know what's happening within our church, but it's also the great joy because as much of a laundry list as I could give you all of all the things that are taking place in our church, which is not abnormal for a church of 142 members. But I could list off a ton of things, and you'd be like, wow, I didn't even know that. And I'm not saying you need to know that, because we know that. We're the pastors. We shepherd. That's why we talk about these things. We pray towards these things. We're engaging the members. We're trying to get to know our church on a whole so that we might present the church in a, a mature fashion. That's the role of the pastor. He cares, he loves, he teaches, he shepherds. He's in the weeds of people's lives. He knows the warts, also the joys. I'm just emphasizing the fact of what we need to do as a congregation, what we need to know, where we need to go and direct the church. So all this leads, okay, the domain, understanding the preciousness of the church, but also the reality that the church is among us. Who are they? Do we know them? Are we in their lives? Sets us up for the duty, the main duty, the main exhortation, which is shepherd them, which we will save for next week. All right. Uh, we'll get more into the duties themselves, extend that out, broaden it out. What's the example we're pulling from? Where's it coming from? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we'll learn more about that next week. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for this morning. I uh, love your church. I love that you've given me the privilege to serve in this capacity. But I also know that in order to be faithful, I need to be convicted of my own faults. I need blind spots to be removed. I need the help and loving uh, feedback from the congregation, as well as from our other pastors. And I just pray that we do faithful work among you, that the pe people entrusted to our care would be able to look at, back at their time with us, however long that is, as a time of, of growth, of love, of protection, of a time where they were instructed, fed, and ultimately pointed towards 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. I pray you'd guide us, that we'd have good conversations this week surrounding this topic, and we would be a, a church that, because of this discussion, uh, becomes more understanding of our roles and responsibilities, as well as a blessing of godly qualified leadership. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.